Howdy everybody and welcome to my Poop Tip Tuesday. I hope you guys are having a great Tuesday. We have a great show today. We're going to determine a couple things. Number one, what, what is the difference between chest pain and heartburn? A lot of people get these two confused and the symptoms can be the same. We'll talk about what do we do about sulfur burps? Do you suffer from that? Do you have really, really, really stinky burps? We'll talk about what causes it and also what you can do to get that taken care of. We'll talk about are energy drink energy drinks safe? Is it something you should rec I recommend? Is it something you should try and use to perk yourself up and feel better. We'll talk about, do you need to close the lid after you flush the toilet? I think you know the answer to that. And we will talk about Zoom meeting poops. Are they real? What can you do? What is going on here? And more, and your live questions on today's Poop Tip Tuesday. Hey guys, my name is Dr. Samir Islam. My passion is to give you tips and tricks to help out with your gut health. I grew up in a small town called Odessa, Texas. You may have known that from the movie Friday Night Lights or even the TV show. I did my undergrad at the University of Texas at Austin, no Longhorns, and I did my GI fellowship training at the Mayo Clinic. So guys, let's talk about poop. All right, so I'm so glad you guys are watching today. If you are watching for the first time, my name is Dr. Islam, and yes, I'm a, I'm your, yes, your poop guru. My passion is to give you tips and tricks to help out with your health. Every Tuesday, I go live on Facebook, YouTube, and also on Instagram at 8.30 p.m. to answer your questions you guys may have asked me. If you want to get your question answered on a poop tip Tuesday and you don't feel comfortable doing it live, subscribe to a weekly newsletter. You can get great tips and tricks and great poop recommendations that I give you every single week. A couple of things. Number one, I would love to hear if you're watching this live or on the replay. And also let me know where you're watching this from. I love to hear where my audience is and if you guys are getting value from this. Hope you guys are having a great Tuesday. It is a beautiful, beautiful day here in Texas. I went for a walk this morning. I had, it was just a great time. I worked out. Today is back day. Got my back on. Got that taken care of. And I'm ready to answer the live questions you guys have for me and the questions that were submitted uh, via email, DM, and other me other ways as well. So question number one, hey, Dr. Islam, uh, I have had chest pain, but I went to go see a cardiologist, a heart doctor, and they said it is related to reflux. Say what? What is the difference between chest pain from your heart and chest pain from acid reflux. Okay, very common question that I get, and this is a very common reason why I get people see me for heart pain. So, a couple of different different a couple of differences that we can have. They symptomatically can feel the same. Whenever you have really bad acid reflux in your chest, it can feel like you're suffering from a heart attack. It can be scary. It can be debilitating, and especially if you have risk factors for heart disease, it can be just really life altering. A couple things you need to know. Number one, if you are having chest pain, don't mess around. Go to the nearest, nearest emergency room, go to your doctor, don't mess around. I can take care of your heartburn and reflux. Not a big deal. That will not kill you. What will kill you is a heart attack. Don't even wait. If you feel like you're having a heart attack, make sure you speak to the nearest doctor or go to the nearest emergency room. But a couple different ways that we can determine this. Number one, if your pain is related to activity, your chest pain gets worse with moving or ambulating, this is most likely related to your heart. If your chest pain is related to eating worsening foods like spicy foods, big foods, or related to meals, there's a very good chance this chest pain is related to your acid reflux. Number two, if you have risk factors for heart disease, you have bad cholesterol, you have diabetes, you have high blood pressure. These are risk factors for heart disease. And if you're having chest pain and you have those risk factors, there's a very good chance this could be heart related. If you don't have those risk factors and you have that chest pain, there is a chance this is not related to heart disease and is actually related to acid reflux as well. Number three, if you suffer from acid reflux, you've had reflux before, and you're having that chest pain, there is a good chance that chest pain is related to acid reflux. Whereas if you've never had acid reflux and all of a sudden you're having really bad crushing chest pain, that is most likely related to your heart. Number four, if that pain radiates to your jaw, to your left side, 
there is a very good chance that could be related to your heart. If your pain doesn't radiate, there's a good chance it is related to uh, acid reflux. And then lastly, if you've had a heart attack in the past and you're having chest pain, I can almost guarantee you that chest pain is related to your heart. If you've not had any heart issues in the past and you're otherwise healthy and you're having chest pain, there's a very good chance that chest pain is related to acid reflux. So even though they symptomatically can feel and look the exact same, there are certain risk factors that we look for as doctors to see if one is related to your heart and if one is related to your gut. So great question. All right, Margaret, you have a great question and Consuelo is good, a good seeing you as well. So Margaret asks, why does my bottom burn when you poop? Very good question. So there are a couple different reasons why that is the case. So one reason is that it could be related to hemorrhoids. Hemorrhoids are the most common reason to have problems in your bottom. Hemorrhoids are dilated veins that occur from either constipation, pushing very hard, straining, being pregnant, and that can cause issues to occur. A common cause or common symptom from hemorrhoids is burning. Absolutely. There are a lot of people who have burning as their symptom from hemorrhoids. And we can usually check to see if that's the case. And sometimes that burning will get worse with spicy foods. Number two is that you could have a tear in your bottom, what's called a fissure. That's a tear in the bottom. It can feel like a burn, but more commonly it feels like a cut on your bottom or it feels like shards of glass. It's another very common reason why you can have that burning. Or lastly, maybe it's something that you ate. Spicy foods will cause burning in your bottom. You have receptors in your bottom that are activated when you have spicy foods. And when, when those receptors get activated, they cause that burning to occur. So absolutely, that's another reason why you could have uh, burning. So Consuelo, it's good seeing you. BJ, it's good seeing you guys as well. Thank you for watching. And if you're starting, uh, let me know if you're watching this uh, live video, either live or on the replay, anywhere you are watching this from. All right, question number two. Hey, Dr. Islam, my burps smell like death. Whoa, my goodness. Maybe TMI. Why do my burps smell so bad? So let me know in the comments, have you suffered from what are called sulfur burps or rotten egg burps or things like that? Let me know in the comments if this is you or if you know somebody who suffered from that as well. Very common problem that can occur for a lot of people. And they see me for this because they just have these burps that just smell terrible. They want to know what is going on. These are called sulfur burps. Very common problem to occur. Why does this occur? Well, a couple different reasons. Number one, it can be related to foods that you eat. Absolutely. If you have foods that are high in sulfur, guess what's going to happen? You're going to have burps that are high in sulfur compounds as well. These foods include things like dried fruits. They cause very commonly sulfur burps. Number two, red meat or even all meats. If your diet is a carnivore diet, you're going to have a lot of sulfur compounds being ingested. That's going to be expelled as burps. And it, can, it can even occur with chicken as well and pork. But it's typically these very red meats or pork that really cause these sulfur burps to occur in terms of dietary, in terms of foods. Number three are canned foods. Foods that you get in a can can have preservatives that can make you more likely to have sulfur burps as well. And number four, four even certain vegetables, specifically cruci uh, cruciferous vegetables, have a high component of sulfur compounds in them. And if you ingest these, they're difficult to digest, they cause bloating, and they can cause sulfur burps as well. And then lastly, certain drinks like alcohol have certain grains that can cause sulfur burps to occur as well. Those are the food category. The second category that can cause really stinky burps are certain digestive conditions that you may have or medical conditions, like a condition like irritable bowel syndrome or IBS. IBS can predispose you to have really, really, really stinky burps and just make it difficult to keep that in. Number two is that you could have an infection in your stomach called H. pylori. H. pylori is a very common bacterial infection that can occur, can cause sulfur burps, pain, indigestion, and has a chance of going into ulcers and cancer as well. Number three is that you could have a condition called small intestinal bacterial overgrowth or SIBO. This is a very common condition. We're seeing this in a lot more people in which you have a predominance of bad bacteria that overwhelms the good guys and that can cause a lot of fermentation and gas and sulfur burps to occur. All right, now that we talked about what causes it, 
What can you do to fix those rotten burps? Okay, first tip, obviously number one, avoid the foods that cause sulfur burps. Meats, get them out. Number two, get rid of those high producing sulfur burps vegetables like cruciferous vegetables. Get rid of them. Remove those canned foods. Remove those other items that can cause sulfur burps. Eliminate dairy products. These are things that tend to cause these sulfur burps to get worse and come on. Uh, number two is that you need to treat the underlying condition. If you have an infection like H. pylori, get it checked, get it treated, get rid of it. If you have small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, get rid of it as well. We have options for that. If you have IBS, had different we have different mechanisms to get that taken care of and hopefully get that resolved uh, as well. Number three, consider adding turmeric to your diet. Turmeric is a fantastic anti-inflammatory treatment that we give. In fact, I spoke to a patient today who's asking, asking me my tips on what we can do to decrease inflammation. One of the best things that you can do is to add turmeric in your diet. Natural powder turmeric has been shown to decrease inflammation and help out with gut issues. Number five, add green tea. Green tea, especially a green tea that has some mint, has been shown to help decrease inflammation inside your gut and allow things to move on and help out with gut issues as well. Uh, number, what are you going on? Number, number, sorry, number, sorry, number five. I apologize. Number five, add chamomile tea. Chem, chamomile tea, I use this all the time. It works really well for indigestion and helps out with gut issues as well. Also try ginger, ginger root or ginger tea or adding ginger or even sucking on ginger itself can really help out with the digestion, decrease the amount of bloat, and decrease those bubbles that are causing sulfur burps as well. Consider adding a lactose enzyme like lactate. This works great, especially if you have lactose intolerance. And then lastly, over-the-counter Beano works fantastic. Beano is my secret weapon when it comes to bloating and gas. Beano has the highest concentration of a substance called simethicone, and simethicone is an anti-gas buster. Boom, it gets rid of that gas, and Beano is one of the more effective ways. But these are my tips to get rid of, get rid of that rotten smell inside your belly and to prevent gas from getting worse. All right. Gina's good seeing you. Sylvia's good seeing you. Margaret's good seeing you. My mind's good seeing you as well. And thank you guys for watching on the live stream. So let's answer a couple of questions. So uh, Mary, uh, Mary, it's good seeing you. Thank you for watching from Odessa. I appreciate that. All right. So let us talk about this. So a couple of things. So Gina, Gina asks, foods that, ha that help heal gastritis. Very, very, very good question. So Let's talk about number one, what is gastritis? So gastritis is inflammation in the stomach. And this is due to a lot of different reasons. It could be due to an infection like H. pylori. It could be due to alcohol. Very commonly can cause gastritis to occur. It can be due to, it can be due to medications like non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. Aleve, naproxen, Advil, Motrin can cause gastritis. It can also be due to bad foods like processed foods, foods that are very high in spice, foods that are very difficult to digest. This can make things worse in terms of gastritis. So how do you heal that? What are some foods that I recommend? So we know that the backbone for gut health is a diet that's high in fiber and a high in fiber. So fiber is the backbone when it comes to gut health. It is the foundation that we can build everything on. And so Gina, if you want to improve your diet with or improve your gastritis with diet, one of the first things I recommend is to eliminate or get rid of red meat as much as you can. Try and get rid of that. I, that will decrease the amount of inflammation inside your stomach and get things better. Number two, increase the amount of fiber in your diet. And the best way to do this is to have a, a big diversity of plants to increase the amount of fiber going into your body, increase the health of your gut microbiome, and to prove what is going on. This will help out with gastritis. Number three, consider adding peppermint as part of your regimen to help heal your, your stomach. Peppermint tea or peppermint oil has been used for a long time to help out with gut issues, indigestion, pain, and gastritis. This is a very effective option that I recommend. Number four, turmeric works great, and I recommend this for a lot of my patients who are hoping to decrease the amount of inflammation. And number five, eliminate some of those other uh, triggers. If you take non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medications, get rid of them. If you drink alcohol, get rid of that. If you smoke, get rid of that. These are things that we can do to help out with gastritis and, and to hopefully allow that to heal naturally. It's a great question, Gina. 
Avelina, it's good seeing you. Thank you guys for watching on the live video. All right. Question number three. Hey, Dr. Islam, I drink a ton of energy drinks. Are they safe? What are my thoughts on them? All right. So energy drinks are now everywhere. I see so many people drinking these energy drinks. I see so many people who are trying to get more, I guess, energy from these drinks. What are my thoughts? So like everything in life, I try to eliminate all the unnecessary things that you don't need. And if you do have something, you want to have it in moderation. So energy drinks, the bad thing about them is that they have so much caffeine. It is crazy the amount of caffeine that are in energy drinks. They're almost two or three times the caffeine in coffee and Coke. And so because of that, they can get you hooked. You can become addicted to these drinks. It's very hard to break that addiction because you people just get so used to that much caffeine that they can't function without that much caffeine that's being in there. Number two is that all that all the all that caffeine can really ramp up your gut. It can make gut symptoms a lot more difficult. It can make reflux a lot more difficult. It can cause diarrhea to occur. It can cause pain to occur. It can really wreck a habit because your gut is going in overdrive because the amount of caffeine uh, that's there. And so I typically do not, I've never recommended using energy drinks. I don't think they're healthy for you. I don't think they're good for you. And keep in mind, a lot of these energy drinks have a lot of unnecessary calories and a lot of unnecessary sugar as well, which can really wreak havoc in terms of what's going on inside your GI tract. So my recommendation is try not to use these energy drinks. All right. Ronnie, it's good seeing you. BJ, it's good seeing you. And Sylvia, it's good seeing you guys as well. Great, great seeing you guys on the live video. So I'm going to answer some questions before I go into my next one. So... Sorry. Margaret, great question. What causes your poop to be yellow? Okay, this is a great question. So I'll tell you a couple things. Number one, I have a video on different colors of poop. I would encourage you to look at that. But let's speak about yellow in general. So number, so yellow is part of the normal spectrum of bowel movements. It's not a big deal. A lot of people have yellow stool, and this can be due to a lot of different reasons. Number one, if you've had your gallbladder removed, there is a good chance that all that bile, which the gallbladder typically stores, is being released in your stool, and that turns out to be yellow. Very common reason to have yellow stool. Number two, if you eat something that has yellow in it, you're gonna poop something that has yellow in it as well. So that's a very common reason. People don't realize that sometimes they ingest foods that have a yellow dye to it, and they don't realize that that's actually what may be being secreted out uh, as well. But the most common reason is usually just bile that is inside the GI tract. And if things can go through with the bile, that's gonna cause your stool to be yellow. And then lastly too, if you have very rapid transit of things passing through, that can cause your stool to become yellow as well because you don't have enough digestion going on. And so if some people have irritable bowel syndrome or maybe Crohn's or colitis, if things go through very, very quickly, that can cause them to have a yellow tinged stool. But in general, yellow stool is not anything to worry about. Great question. All right. Perfect. All right, Sylvia. Good question. How much water do I need to drink a day? So it's a very good question. So, you know, I think, you know, we have this idea that you need to drink about eight cups of water per day. You know, I actually looked into the research behind this. We actually don't have really good evidence that eight glasses of or eight cups of water, eight glasses of water is actually what you really, really need. And so here's my recommendation. Um, you want to kind of aim to where your urine is light color. And so whether that's eight glasses or not, whether at six, it really just kind of depends on each individual person. I tend to drink as much water as I can, A, because I like water. Number two, I know water has no calories and it's healthy for you. And number three, you really can't go wrong with drinking more and more water. So my recommendation, kind of use your urine as a determinant factor for how much water you want to drink. I wouldn't focus necessarily on the number, I would focus on more in terms of how yellow or concentrated your urine is. All right, perfect. All right, so let's answer another question I got from a DM. Hey, Dr. Islam, do you need to close the lid when you actually flush the toilet? Oh, man. So how many of you guys, let me know in the comments, how many of you guys have made this mistake of not closing the lid whenever you flush the toilet? Or have you been told that? 
I'm really curious about that. So what happens and tell me, so what happens whenever you flush the toilet? Well, in essence, it is like a fecal fountain. Yes, it really is. And so, you know, obviously when you, when you use the restroom, all that stool, all that urine is sitting in that pot that's there. And immediately when you flush it, guess what happens? All those particles bust open and they go everywhere. And in fact, there's been studies to show that that material, whether it's feces or urine, can spray up to 10 feet. Holy Toledo Batman. That means that stuff will get into your toothbrush. It'll get into your hairbrush if it's outside. Maybe into your shaving equipment, equipment as well. Exactly right. Kaboom! It just goes everywhere. And so people don't realize this may be a reason why they're getting sick, why they don't feel good, why they do everything that they need to do to keep themselves healthy, but they keep on getting just not feeling very, very good. So something as simple as having a lid and closing it will actually prevent that from occurring, prevent that explosion. And guess what? There's a reason why we have lids because we want to close that toilet bowl and then flush. That is going to prevent that explosion from occurring and prevent things from getting everywhere. So my recommendation as your poop guru, yes, close the lid on that toilet before you flush. Your toothbrush will thank you. Your hairbrush will thank you. Your doctor will thank you. And your gut bacteria will thank you as well. All right. Marlo, it's good seeing you. Thank you for uh, closing the lid. On the toilet, perfect, sounds good. All right, last question I got in the DM before I answer some more um, live questions you guys have. And thank you so much for posting on the live chat. Also, once again, let me know if you're watching this live or on the replay. Let me know if you're enjoying these lives. Also, let me know if there's something you want me to change as well. I'm trying to improve this every single week. So I'd love to hear what you guys have to say and let me know where you're watching this from as well. So last question I got before I answer more live, vid live videos. Hey, Dr. Islam. I have heard about this condition called Zoom meeting poops. Is this real? What is going on? And more importantly, can I fix this? All right. So all of us, including me, are stuck in these freaking Zoom meetings all day long. And there's this tendency of people who are about to get on to all of a sudden feel the urge to use the restroom. I've seen this phenomenon more and more and more. What is going on? Well, a couple different reasons. Number one, and this is a real problem. A lot of people are having this issue where they're about to go on and get on a Zoom and all of a sudden they gotta go and they gotta go right then and there. And so what we think is going on is the connection between the brain and the gut. So sometimes, you know, whenever you're in a meeting, especially if you're in an important meeting or meeting somebody who can really, uh, in a very stressful meeting, that stress can really trigger a lot of gut issues to occur. It's called the brain gut axis. It acts as a super highway from here to your gut and that causes your GI tract to act up and go really, really crazy to push things out and to cause worsening bowel issues, which can make you more likely to use a restroom. Number two is that sometimes just the stress of being in a meeting constantly can really make you feel the urge to go. It can cause your GI tract to push things a lot faster and make you use the restroom. So it is a real phenomenon. So what can you do about this? So what I typically recommend, obviously, try and use the restroom when you can. It is very important for you to not try to hold that bowel movement in because that can cause some problems. It can cause your rectum to become bigger and it can cause hemorrhoid issues, fissure issues, and all sorts of constipation issues as well. So this is a real phenomenon. This is a real problem that people have and you are not alone if you're suffering from this. And if you're having this issue, try to take proactive measures to use the restroom before you actually have that meeting to help out with what's going on. Great question I got. All right, perfect. Gwinnett, thank you for watching from Ethiopia. I think you have so far beaten the furthest in terms of someone who's watched from me, though I did have somebody from Taiwan though, I will tell you that. All right, let me go through some of the live questions again. Um, So Gina asks, how does one test for small intestinal bacterial overgrowth? Great question, Gina. So there's three ways we can test this. Number one is that if I clinically think that you have this, 
I'll just treat you for it. So you don't necessarily have to be treated or tested for this condition. If I think that you have it based on your symptoms, based on your risk factors, I can certainly just treat you empirically. Number two is that sometimes we can do what's called a breath test where we actually have you breathe into a machine and based on the result of that test, we can determine if you actually have this condition or not. And if you do, we can treat you. And then lastly, the gold standard, the number one, one way, one way to, test, to test for this is actually get fluid sample from your small intestine. And we actually do this ourselves. We're actually able to get fluid sample from your small intestine, look at this under the microscope and check the predominance of bad bacteria to good bacteria. And if we see a predominance of bad guys, we will help, we will diagnose this in the right clinical setting and then we can put you on some treatment to get that taken care of for you. Great question. All right. Perfect. Evelina, thank you for watching from Levelin. I appreciate it. All right. Perfect. All right, guys, I think I've gone through most of the questions. I want to thank you guys for watching again. Now, if you want to uh, get more information, a couple things. Number one, like my page, subscribe, like, and share. Number two, don't forget to subscribe to a weekly newsletter. We can get better. We can get great tips. I wouldn't say better, but great tips and tricks every week. And also number three, I would love to hear what comments you guys have to say. Let me know what you guys think. And I really would appreciate any feedback on what we're doing. Hope you guys are having a great and happy day. And I'll see you guys next Tuesday. Thanks, everybody. Take care.